Good afternoon. The next item of business today is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on the Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report for 2016, setting Scotland's future direction on the low-carbon transition. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions after our statement, so any member who wishes to ask a question, I would encourage you to press your request to speak button now. And I call on Rosanna Cunningham. Um, give me an opportunity to update Parliament on Scotland's contribution to global efforts to tackle climate change. The need for rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented global change in response to the challenge of climate change has been clearly set out in the recent report from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I welcome the report and I'm pleased that we have moved away from debating whether climate change is real or not. The evidence set out by the IPCC is the culmination of a comprehensive global assessment of the science underpinning the Paris Agreement aim of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. The report makes clear that achieving this, as opposed to allowing warming of two degrees or more, would significantly reduce the negative impacts for humans and the environment. All countries, as well as businesses and individuals, need to act now if the Paris Agreement aims are to be met. We can be proud that Scotland has been one of the first countries to respond to the agreement with proposals for strengthened, legally binding emissions reduction targets. And that is the purpose of the Climate Change Bill, which was introduced in May. The IPCC report says that we must act quickly. Scotland has already reduced its emissions by almost half, and our climate change plan sets out a credible package of immediate on-the-ground delivery measures to continue driving these down. The new bill sets targets for 2020 and 2030 that are the most stretching statutory goals of any country in the world. The IPCC report says that the world needs to be carbon neutral, meaning net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. With our current bill targets, that is exactly where Scotland will be. The bill not only sets new targets, but builds on the world leading approach established by this parliament's 2009 act. This is recognised by representatives of other leading countries. For example, Anders Weikman, chair of the Climate Kick think tank and former Swedish lawmaker, said in evidence to the ECCLR committee earlier this week that he very much applauds the Scottish approach of including a fair share of the emissions from international aviation and shipping in our targets. And I suspect that's because Sweden doesn't. The transition to a carbon neutral Scotland will fundamentally reshape our economy and society over the coming decades. There will be many opportunities, but also some challenges, and we must ensure that no one is left behind. And that is why the Scottish Government is establishing a Just Transition Commission to provide expert advice on adjusting to a low carbon economy in a fair way. Professor Jim Skier has already been named as chair of the commission, and together we will ensure that further commission appointments have the breadth of experience that is needed. The independent expert advice of the UK Committee on Climate Change plays a key role in setting emissions reduction targets that are both stretching and credible. Credibility is vital. Without it, there is a risk of committing future governments to actions that are in any practical sense unachievable. However, the Scottish Government does want to achieve net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases as soon as possible. It is our intention to get there and we will set a target date for this as soon as it can be done, credibly and responsibly. In light of the IPCC's report, I have joined the UK and Welsh governments in writing to the CCC to ask that it provides updated advice on national target levels. We've asked the committee to provide its advice no later than March next year. If it advises that even more ambitious Scottish targets are now credible, then we will adopt them. Certainly other countries around the world do need to step up and match Scotland's ambition and action if the Paris Agreement is to be delivered. But if we look closer to home, Scotland will reach net zero emissions sooner if all parts of the UK work together. Many of the key levers, such as decarbonising the gas grid, remain reserved to the UK government. And that is why it's important that the Committee for Climate Change's advice considers what is feasible across all parts of the UK. The risk of a no-deal Brexit and what that means for our environment is also very real and I call on the UK government to ensure that its approach to this does not jeopardise the delivery of emissions reductions. 
The Scottish Government supports continued participation in the EU emissions trading system as the most cost-effective route to decarbonise energy-intensive industry. The UK Government's approach to a no-deal exit would, remain, it would mean that we lose access to the EU ETS. We are deeply concerned that the UK Government intends to introduce a carbon tax in its place, which would remove accountability to the Scottish Parliament for emissions reduction from key sectors of the Scottish economy, since the tax would be reserved. Such a reduction in devolved powers and accountability is unacceptable to the Scottish Government, and we have written jointly with the Welsh Government to express our concerns and urgently request ministerial meetings between all four administrations. On a more positive note, I would now like to turn to Scotland's progress to date in reducing emissions. The statutory Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report was laid in Parliament yesterday and confirms that Scotland's annual emissions reduction target for 2016 was met, meaning we've reached our target for the third year in a row. Most importantly, Scotland's actual emissions are now down by almost half in the long term, a 49% reduction since the 1990 baseline. So we continue to outperform the UK as well as Western European countries. In fact, only Sweden has done better. Scotland's excellent progress has been recognised by the Committee for Climate Change in its recent annual progress report. The committee also found that our current climate change plan represents an ambitious statement of intent and a stretching and credible pathway to delivering further reductions. One of the key features of Scotland's current climate change plan is that it includes a monitoring framework which will help us to keep track of where changes in approach may become necessary. And yesterday, uh, we published the first annual monitoring report from this framework. The information in this report complements the annual emission statistics and independent overviews of progress from the Committee uh, for Climate Change. By providing more detail on the on-the-ground implementation of the policies in the plan. I appreciate that expectations around the monitoring framework will quite rightly be high. Uh, however, it has been less than a year since the plan itself was published and it is simply too early to make an assessment of whether the plan as a whole is on track. For example, quality assured data for 2018 is not yet available for many of the indicators. However, this first year's reporting does provide a baseline for future assessments of progress. It also provides the foundation from which we will continue to develop and improve the monitoring framework itself. The new bill proposes that the framework be placed on a statutory footing for future years, with individual sector-by-sector -sector monitoring reports being laid before Parliament. Most of my statement so far has been about climate change mitigation, but I would also like to take this opportunity to raise Parliament's awareness of our work on adaptation, which featured strongly in this year's programme for government. Next year, the second Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme will be published. An outcomes-based approach derived from both the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Scotland's National Performance Framework is being developed. Over the course of the next few months, the Scottish Government will be engaging with stakeholders and consulting widely on how we can secure the right outcomes for Scotland from our approach to adaptation. Presiding officer, I've been pleased to update Parliament on Scotland's excellent progress in tackling climate change. This success has been founded on an evidence-based approach and we are committed to maintaining this. We recognise the global importance of the new report from the IPCC and we've joined the UK and Welsh governments in commissioning updated independent expert advice from the Committee on Climate Change on what this means for our own targets. I will also be proud to take Scotland's positive messages to the UN Climate Change Conference in Poland in December. This meeting, COP24, will take stock of global efforts through the culmination of the Talanoa dialogue process and seek to agree the rule book for how the Paris Agreement will be implemented. Scotland has a very strong message to share with the rest of the world. Our low carbon transition demonstrates that deep emissions reductions are achievable and that these can be delivered in a way that promotes sustainable and fair economic growth. Presiding officer, I should say that this is a statement delivered in keeping with the statutory responsibility laid out in the 2009 Climate Change Act. If the new climate change uh, bill comes into force uh, before this time next year, this will turn out to have been the last of these statements. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We turn now to questions, and we begin with Maurice Golden to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of the statement. A low-carbon transition is a vital component of reducing Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions and achieving our climate change targets. The recent IPCC report on global warming states that if urgent action is not taken to cut emissions, global warming could reach 1.5 degrees as early as 2030. Scotland has already made good progress in transitioning to a low carbon economy by, decarbon by decarbonising our electricity and waste sectors. However, it is imperative that we look to other sectors, particularly transport, to meet our future targets, specifically post-2032. Both the UK and Scottish governments have sought expert advice from the UK Committee on Climate Change on achieving an achievable pathway to net zero by 2050. If the UK CCC identifies a pathway, will the Cabinet Secretary adopt this in full? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, that is the commitment that I have made and that the government has made. Um, what has held us back to now is the uh, CCC being unable to um, actually outline that credible pathway. And in the absence of that being available to us, uh, we felt that to uh, to draft the bill in any other way than we have done at the moment would be unwise, but we do want to get there. Um, and if the newly commissioned advice comes forward with that credible pathway, then absolutely we will do so, and we will ensure that the bill reflects that advice. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement. Scottish Labour welcomes the success of a 49 percent actual emissions reduction between 1990 and 2016, proving to this chamber that once seemingly ambitious targets <coughs> drive innovation and bolster climate action. The IPP, IPCC report has the strongest warning yet, which we all know about. Um, has or will the Scottish Government assess the draft climate change bill in terms of Scotland's carbon budget and in terms of its contribution to global temperature rise. And we must heed the IPCC's call for, I quote, rapid and far-reaching transitions in the sectors we are talking about today. And this is why Scottish Labour calls for a target of 77% emissions reductions by 2030. Will the Cabinet Secretary act on this now? Because we do have the, the information to set a pathway for that now. And finally, given the climate change plans discrepancies in sectoral ambition. What is the Cabinet Secretary doing to address this? And has she considered sectoral targets to ensure all sectors play their fair part to adapt by 2030 and beyond? And very finally, Scottish Labour wishes the Cabinet Secretary very good luck for Poland. Thank you. It's not a question. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I thank Claudia Beamish um, for her... Um, uh, for her good luck for Katowice in, uh, in December. Um, I'm really hoping that by December the weather in uh, Poland is, uh, is amenable to travel in a reasonable amount of time. Um, to take on board her points in respect to the IPCC, I, I, I kind of feel as if I've made it fairly clear that we are very closely uh, looking at and heeding uh, uh, the advice that we are getting. Um, you know, we are asking the UK Committee on Climate Change to, to give us uh, some of the detail and some of the, uh, the credible pathway uh, advice that they were unable to give us in their last advice. Um, and, uh, uh, and that is because of what the IPCC has said. So we have acted uh, as a result uh, of what we've seen in the IPCC. Um, the bill, in the way it is currently drafted, uh, all of the statements made by myself, by the First Minister, make it very clear that the intention is to do net zero gre uh, greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. Uh, when it is credible, uh, when the pathway is clear. Uh, and if that is uh, uh, made clear to us in the next few months, then absolutely uh, that is how we will approach it. And I, I think my response to Maurice Golden made that clear as well. In respect of sectoral targets, I, I, this is a kind of old discussion, I, I guess. Um, uh, we, we, we are taking a whole economy approach in, in respect of it. We do set kind of uh, sectoral 
envelopes, but uh, uh, we're not actually fixing statutory targets. And, and, and that's for a very good reason. First of all, um, you, you're, uh, uh, the difficulty, and I, I think I've said this before in the Chamber, the difficulty of assigning uh, uh, measures to particular sectors when uh, they will cut right across sectors. We, where there's a lot of work being done in energy efficiency uh, uh, just now. Well, do energy efficiency measures contribute to reducing emissions in energy supply? Or do they uh, uh, contribute to reducing emissions in residential and public sector buildings? How do we make that decision? And if you set a target for one and not the other, uh, um, you, you're, you, you end up not really uh, uh, achieving what you're trying to achieve. And we've, we've done incredibly well. Um, sectoral targets could also be highly uncertain because in certain areas, data revisions can have a disproportionate effect on uh, specific sectors. So, so for, you know, for example, land use and forestry, it would have been extremely difficult to have set sectoral targets over the last few years because the data revisions, the science around all of that has changed so significantly that any attempt to set sectoral targets would have come, uh, uh, come apart. Uh, and I think that those are reasons why, uh, and it's not just Scotland that doesn't have sectoral emission targets. I, I, I think from my, from my understanding of the advice uh, or the evidence uh, from the Swedish representatives at the committee on Tuesday, Sweden doesn't do sectoral targets for much the same reason uh, as, as we've chosen not to do them as well. So, you know, we, we are still of the view that the whole economy approach is the most sensible way to do it, that sectoral emission targets will provide an unnecessarily inflexible uh, approach uh, and won't be particularly helpful in the long run. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary mentions the urgent warning in the IPCC report that we must act quickly. But what isn't mentioned in the statement is the author's warning that the actions we take between now and 2030 are the most crucial for delivering low carbon transport, warm homes and greener farming. The proposed target for 2030 sets the bar too low so that barely any extra action needs to be taken beyond what has already been discussed. So if Scotland has stand any chance of meeting a future net zero emissions target, why is the Scottish Government not committing to more ambition on our next milestone target for 2030? And why is it not considering the benefits that strong technical innovation can bring? Because estimates so far have been based on very conservative thinking about what is technically possible. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the problem with uh, uh, basing our, our, uh, our plans on technical innovations, which we have no idea about, um, uh, create, as a, uh, create a difficulty. Now, it is possible, I suppose, that we can take a view that we simply set targets and shrug our shoulders and hope for the best, which does appear to be, uh, in some places, what happens. It's not the approach that we've been taking in Scotland. Uh, and I would rather stick to uh, the dogged, uh, continued, continued success of the approach that we've taken in Scotland, and it's been shown to be successful, uh, in achieving uh, our ends and continue in that manner uh, because that is the way I believe we will achieve uh, uh, the, the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, I, I would remind people that this bill was introduced to Parliament before the IPCC uh, report, so we were already looking at increasing our targets, we were already looking at increasing our ambition. The IPCC report does bring some more urgency into it, which is exactly why we've asked the UK Committee on Climate Change to reassess what we're doing in the light of the urgency raised by the IPCC. So we will wait to listen to the advice of our statutory advisers and we will act accordingly. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Stuart Stevens. Thank you. Can I start by uh, thanking the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement and welcome confirmation that further advice has been sought from the UK Committee on Climate Change. Uh, the latest advice from IPPC could not be more stark in the case for upping our efforts uh, to combat climate change more compelling. Uh, she referred to the appointment of Professor Jim Ski as the chair of the Just Transition Commission. Could she set out the timetable for appointing the uh, additional members and when she would expect the commission to come forward re with recommendations? And given that uh, in 2015 uh, the energy efficiency of Scotland's buildings was set as a national infrastructure prior priority, since when we've seen residential emissions rise uh, in 2015? 2015 and 2016. When does she expect that trend to begin to be reversed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, um, as, the, as the member refers to, I have in fact already appointed Jim Skia as the chair of the commission. What we've got to do now is set about ensuring um, that the members of the commission um, do reflect the, the range of 
issues that, that will need to be discussed. Um, since our intention is that the Commission will run for approximately two years um, in, the, uh, in its initial uh, uh, um, uh, work, then uh, I would hope that we have the Commission up and running uh, early in the new year. I'm not wanting to put a specific time on that, though, because it does depend on us being able to ensure that we are populating the Commission itself uh, with the right people. Uh, I think the member then went on to ask me about um, some more specific issues in respect of, uh, of buildings, uh, if, if I'm correct. Um, yeah, um, the, 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 I mean, there is a lot of work being done, as, as, the, as the member knows, that will change the emissions in terms of, uh, of buildings. Uh, energy Efficient Scotland is going to help remove poor energy efficiency. Um, uh, that will have an impact, a positive impact in terms of fuel poverty, as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the member will know that there's an enormous amount of work currently going on um, uh, uh, in respect of energy efficiency uh, in this parliament. Um, we've got a number of commitments that we want to make in respect of uh, Scotland's homes uh, and buildings. Um, and I, I think if, it, if the member's looking for very much more specific issue, uh, uh, responses, I will, I will ask my colleague Kevin Stewart to write to him specifically uh, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the particular areas. Um, but we are on track to deliver a 2016 programme gov uh, for government commitment uh, in respect of energy efficiency. Um, and we do uh, believe uh, that we are going to be making, uh, able to make um, uh, really good progress in this area. I appreciate there have been detailed questions and detailed answers. There are now eight minutes for the remaining nine questions and answers. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by John Scott. Uh, John Gummer, when he appeared in front of the Environment Committee, uh, and he's the chair of the Climate Change uh, Committee, said that it would be challenging to deliver an answer for UK, Scotland and Wales by March next year. Is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied uh, that a jointly commissioning advice was the correct thing to do? And will Scotland get particular advice out of that that's going to be useful for us? Well, climate change is a global issue and it does require a cross-border response. So I think we were probably uh, in the right place to doing that. No, no one country is going to deliver the whole solution. Um, uh, and, and therefore, the, the joint letter uh, that was signed, I think, was an appropriate uh, way um, uh, uh, to progress this. I mean, obviously, um, some of our activity is influenced by the ambitions and actions of neighbours. Um, I, I think I referenced in my uh, statement itself the issue with, uh, with the gas grid. Um, I, I, and for those reasons, I think joining with the UK and Welsh governments uh, was the right thing to do. I've asked that the advice be available in time for Parliament, the Scottish Parliament, both to consider it and to complete the passage of the Climate Change Bill before the summer recess. But the most important thing, I think, from the point of view of the Bill itself, is that our decisions are informed by the advice of the Committee on Climate Change. So uh, uh, I wouldn't want to see the Bill proceed before we have that advice. Um, so the plan is um, to get that advice in a timely manner to allow us to take the bill forward. Uh, but let's see if the Committee on Climate Change can do so in the timescale that we've asked. John Scott, to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm declaring an interest as a farmer, but the Cabinet Secretary rightly recognises that expectations surrounding the monitoring framework for the Climate Change Plan are high. When can we expect an assessment to be made of whether the plan is on track or not, and when will the individual sector-by-sector sector reports first be laid before Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> I didn't realise that the individual sector-by-sector sector reports were being awaited so, so enthusiastically. <laughs> Um, future years, really, for the monitoring reports, the timing of this, I mean, obviously, this is the very first one. By its, by its nature, it will not be uh, um, uh, uh, complete. We're expecting them to be uh, produced each October uh, uh, um, uh, when, they're, when they're published. Um, that's the statutory uh, uh, footing that I referred to earlier. Um, assessing whether individual indicators are on track uh, um, one by one for this First year's reporting, the assessments have been based on the judgment of lead officials for that area. Um, that's obviously not what will go on being the case um, because we are keen to explore ways to make the assessment process 
as consistent and transparent as possible for future reports. But we are obviously discussing with stakeholders how this will be progressed. Um, and uh, uh, there are some indicators at the moment where I'm conscious that there are no, there's no data available. It's just a function, I think, of this being the very first uh, to be published. So stakeholder engagement is ongoing um, and we will ensure uh, that Parliament is, and the committee is kept updated uh, on the work that's being done. Gil Patterson to be followed by Polly McNeill. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand a bit further around uh, what she has said on adaptation? And can she confirm that stakeholders, uh, indeed, uh, their engagement will play a key role in this? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, indeed. Um, the, re the, the Scottish Government is required to set out a climate change adaptation programme every uh, five years. Um, the programme has to include policies and proposals, both for action and for research. Um, I, I did say we were taking an outcomes-based uh, approach. We we're not just identifying uh, risks. We we're working on the outcomes we want for Scotland uh, as we adapt to climate change in terms of our communities, infrastructure, natural environment, and the economy. And these are closely linked to the National Performance Framework and the Sustainable Development Goals. There's digital and face-to-face -face stakeholder engagement sessions taking place over the next few months to help develop the programme prior to formal consultation early next year. And as part of the process, we're developing adaptation-focused climate conversations to engage communities throughout Scotland from the borders to Shetland. And those people who engage on Twitter may already have seen two Twitter sessions uh, on natural resources and infrastructure uh, have already taken place. And the first face-to-face -face workshop was held yesterday in Inverness. Um, engagement has been lively so far and I look forward to that continuing. I look forward to the committee's continued interest uh, and of course uh, uh, some of the um, uh, interesting outcomes in terms of adaptation are seen uh, when, you, when you look at things like the Climate Ready, uh, uh, the, the, the Climate Ready Clyde uh, initiative which got quite a lot of coverage this morning, Edinburgh adapts. Uh, these are often being done on a on a more regional basis, and I would advise members to keep a good lookout if there's one coming for their own local area. Polly McNeill is to be followed by Bill Kidd. Thank you. The textile sector alone accounts for 6 or 7 per cent of the direct and indirect carbon emissions in the world. And there are many examples of electronics which are deliberately designed for single use. What action is the Scottish Government taking to improve the sustainability of the growing consumption in the fashion and the electronics industries? both for consumers and the industries themselves. Uh, well, as it happens, I have flagged up to officials that I think that uh, the textile industry in particular is probably one of the coming big uh, issues that is going to, that, that is going to confront us. Um, at the moment, there are, it's quite limited in terms of what we can actually do. Uh, and one of the big issues will be around the just transition um, uh, concerns, because obviously uh, a very great many of the the, the textile products that we use are made uh, a very long way away by people who don't get paid terribly much, um, but whose jobs are nevertheless important. So it's actually quite a tricky issue to deal with, and it is one that I think needs to be dealt with globally. Uh, but uh, Pauline McNeill can rest assured I have already flagged this up to officials. I have already warned them we will start getting questions about this, and here's the first. Um, so I congratulate Pauline on being uh, the first. Uh, electronics, I suppose, sits in that same kind of conversation because none of us want to be without the uh, electronics that we use. Um, uh, but managing a sustainable way to have them produced again is going to take a very big global conversation. Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the third, fourth and fifth carbon budgets are excluded from the scope of advice being requested from the Committee on Climate Change. As climate change is a devolved issue, was there ever a possibility that this would mean Scotland's targets up to 2032 would also be seen as out of scope? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, that, that, was a, that was a confusion uh, arising out of the fact that the letter was being signed by three different administrations. Uh, I had uh, presumed that people would see the, uh, the carbon budget line and know that that was about Westminster, um, but since that uh, appeared not to be the case, uh, we have just separately written to uh, uh, to clear up that. We, we want uh, um, all of the targets uh, that the, the, the 
that are proposed in the bill to be looked at. Um, we have no difficulty with that whatsoever. Uh, we've made that absolutely clear, um, and uh, that was just one of those items of confusion that arose out of the fact that you had three administrations signing a letter. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies to Finlay Carson, Fulton McGregor, Alex Rowley and John Mason, but I'm afraid we have no time this afternoon. Uh, we just all members and ministers to reflect on the length of questions and answers. We'll move on to the next item of business, which is a statement on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route update. Uh, and I will we'll just take a few seconds if we can to change seats.